Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Talk Story with John Waihe'e. We are just, uh, <coughs> we are following up on our last show where we had a Mr. Stanley Lau and our discussion was about the constitutional amendment which will be on the ballot this November which will allow the state to tax investment property for education. Mr. Lau presented the uh, the, uh, the view opposing the amendment. This morning I thought it would be only fair to have someone who was in favor of the constitutional amendment. And so we have a special guest, Mr. Corey Rosen Lee, and he is the president of the Hawaii Teachers Association. School Teachers Association? Hawaii State Teachers Association. Oh, Hawaii State Teachers Association, which represents all of the hardworking people in our schools. So, Corey, welcome. Thank you. Before we go any further, you know, I, I have to declare in terms of uh, total, I guess, um, you know, uh, total disclosure, that I am not, not necessarily in favor of this. But I do believe in uh, what you're trying to do. And so, I, I guess, why don't you um, maybe start off by explaining mm -hmm. uh, the amendment for, uh, as you see it. And uh, I really want to know why you think it's needed. So I saw the show, um, and one of the important things is I, I heard your opinion at the time. And what are the thing is, is I find that if we can have a five minute conversation with people usually about this and why it's needed, that most people do support it. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do is we just feel like if we can cut through all the clutter and a lot of the fear that's being used around it, I think at the end of the day, we get a lot of support. So yeah, what, because I want to talk really about why we have it and not just about how terrible it would be to see property taxes raised. Right, right, right. So let's, let's you know, what, what does it do? So let's start off with the, the, the problem, okay, um, and what we're trying to solve. And let's, I'd like to, someone in this conversation today, talk about the problem in Hawaii, but specifically for Native Hawaiian children. Okay, great. Because I think that it's very important that you know, I think that Native Hawaiians should be one of the biggest proponents of this bill. But the first problem is this. So the question is what's going on currently in our schools? And what we've seen right now is the most important factor in how a student does in the classroom is the teacher. Right, and absolutely. We have seen over the last six years that the amount of teachers leaving Hawaii to go teach on the mainland has increased by, I think, nearly over 80%. And what's the main cause for that, if you don't mind me asking? There's no one cause, okay? Um, you cannot solve this through one, pro, uh, one bullet here. One of the biggest problems we have, of course, is funding. Right. When you adjust for cost of living, our teachers are the lowest paid in the nation. Uh, there is a study that came out today from Wallet Hub that says Hawaii is the worst state to teach in the nation. Because of the cost of living? Cost factor? of living and, uh, yes, primarily. So you and Stanley are actually on the same side when okay. it comes to cost of living, both of you. But a lot of the people in this argument are trying to say, no, don't adjust for cost of living. And that's a ridiculous thing because everything in Hawaii is adjusted for cost of living. But because of this, we have this over a thousand classrooms that don't have a qualified teacher. And what that means is, and I've seen this firsthand, is these kids go to school and they can have an emergency hire or they have a substitute. Right. But the substitute does not have to know the content of that classroom. And so you will have a... So they just system. show up and babysit. Exactly. Yeah. And what we've seen then is, is that... In, so we have a thousand classrooms um, and we want to think that... So we estimate that somewhere about a, about a third of our students, a third right. of our public school students on a daily basis go to school and at least one of their teachers is not qualified. But the reality is this. Some of our students probably go their entire career without having one substitute emergency hire. And some children, primarily those come from poor communities or rural like communities. Like Native Hawaiian communities. Native Hawaiian communities. Or, or communities with a lot of uh, immigrant uh, children or, or the like, right. right? So they're more likely to have um, unqualified, un out of field, and inexperienced teachers. So, there was a study done by the U.S. Department of Education in 2015. Right. And they were looking to see, was there uh, specifically certain areas where you would have this problem, and were there certain ethnic groups 
that had it. And so one of the things they looked at was the Nanakuli Wainai area, where it's 81% Title I or uh, high poverty. 81%? And 81%. And this is the part that's scary right now across the entire state, is what we've seen in the last few years is now a majority of our students right. are now Title I, which means that we have totally created two school systems. One for, again, I mean, we've okay. gone back, to the, the, the whole idea of the democratic revolution Absolutely. was to end the idea but of two school systems. But we're going the opposite system. direction. We are now creating two school systems, one that's well-funded, that does everything that education is supposed to do, and another school system that doesn't have teachers or 100 degree classrooms or broken desks. So it's not, it's not necessarily just about... Uh, Money. I mean, it's you, you need to do. You need to also use it well. You need to attract sure. teachers. You need, but you need but more. You need more money to get to those things. Right. So back to the thing. So they, they looked at the Nanakuli Waina area, and they found that one out of every five teachers had less than one year of teaching experience. Wow. Um, I think it was like nine percent that were unqualified. Another like eight percent were out of field which meant you may have an English teacher doing special education but doesn't know how to do special education. You know what's so surprising okay. to me is that uh, the, despite that, despite that, teachers give an awful lot and they try to make the schools as best they can, but can you really do that with, uh, with the shortages that you're describing? Can you actually take a school that is under... I wouldn't say necessarily underfunded or less funded than someplace else, but under uh, staffed or under just not up to par so we have great teachers at every school right it's not about that we're saying that we have bad teachers it's that look when i first started teaching teaching is hard yeah it okay? is <laughs> it, it, it takes time to learn the craft and when you constantly have these high turnover and it's constantly for the same group of students right we're basically denying them an education. So this 2015 equity report said that high minority, um, um, high native native schools are more likely to have unqualified teachers, excuse me, out of field teachers and inexperienced teachers. Okay, and uh, uh, so I, I remember, you mentioned to me that there was a, an additional study done on native Hawaiian children by uh, Kamehameha schools. So the, what does that show? The, the question is this, if we were to increase funding for our schools, would that have a huge impact for our Native Hawaiian students inside of our public schools and for the Native Hawaiian community? And the answer is yes. And there's two reports that you can look at. One was the Kamehameha Schools report, and it showed that they looked at both Kamehameha School students and they looked at all Native Hawaiians. Right. And the one thing to look at the all Native Hawaiians is that includes Native, uh, Kamehameha School students so the numbers would actually be less if it was public school versus Kamehameha schools. And the first one they said is reading at grade level or higher in grade three. So Kamehameha school student schools was at 89% and the all Native Hawaiian learners was at 62. So there's still a gap. There's when they start a, off. Yeah, but there's, there's about a 27% gap. But then the real important number is to look at this one. Graduated from high school on time and prepared for the next step. 92. That means you can go to college yes. or vocational schools or have a better life, frankly. 92% of Kamehameha School students are ready for that next step. All Native Hawaiian students is 25%. So between, wow. between third and 12th grade, you're, you're losing close to 40% of those students. You start off um, under anyway. Yes. But what happens is that it actually starts to expand the, the number of people that are left behind, I guess exactly. you would say. And so you have this large group of students that are either dropping out of school, not going on to college, and therefore not having a lot of opportunity. I, I would assume that in addition to the Native Hawaiian students, you might find something very similar happening in other, uh, with other ethnic groups or other groups uh, in areas that are, are poverty stricken. We just don't have a Kamehameha schools to compare sure. them to. But the interesting thing too is this, is that we have a racial divide in Hawaii's public schools, in Hawaii schools, I should say, not public schools. Native Hawaiians 
have the largest percentage of public school students in the state. Really? Despite yes. the fact that they have their own Kamehameha school yes. system? So they're overrepresented in the public schools and underrepresented in the private schools. While Caucasians, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans are overrepresented in the private schools and underrepresented in, in the, the public, public schools. schools. What so, about Filipinos? And so Filipinos are the second largest ethnic group in our schools. Native Hawaiians and Filipinos make up about half of all of our students in our public schools, just those two ethnic groups. I mean, we, those two ethnic groups ought to be furious with these statistics. They should absolutely be furious. This is systemic, institutional racism and uh, segregation that in order to provide... See, you're getting my okay. 60s blood okay. all okay. turning here. But this is the thing is, is that if we invest in some children and our private schools spend two to three times as much and we deny other children public basic education, so I'll give you the statistic. So last year, there were 19 openings for special education teachers in the Nanakuliwana area, and they're only able to hire one qualified teacher. Wow. So over three years, there were 65 openings, and they were only able to have five teachers. So imagine you are a Native Hawaiian special education student, you know, going to the You start off behind the eight ball, But every single say. year, what every single year, you're denied that qualified teacher. How do we expect them to do well? So Native Hawaiian children that are special education at Waianae, 50% are chronically absent. <laughs> wow. Because by that time, they've been denied an education or they're going to school and have someone that may not be trained. Why do we expect that they keep on going to school? Right, right, absolutely not. But you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I actually um, detected uh, something, uh, also, uh, something else, a little subtle. You know, because what we're comparing is the fact that these other groups have uh, access and are in private schools. But it seems that you're also suggesting that within the public school system, there are schools that have, uh, you know, have all the teachers that they need and, and uh, get a better shake than places like Waianae and Nanakuli. So, <laughs> It's not the fact that we're just saying, oh, public schools uh, have these results and private schools have something else. You're also saying within the public school system, there are districts that apparently uh, don't have teachers, like Y9 on uh, or qualified teachers. Sure, so, the, so we're, the lack of teachers is not uniform, but what we have seen is, it used to be, like for example, elementary education. There was the idea that you could never get a job if you wanted to be an elementary education teacher. That's not, yeah, it was so... Now we have a huge shortage in elementary education teachers. Really? Yes. Wow. Everything across the field. I never thought they would have an emergency hire for a social studies teacher. I'm a social <laughs> studies teacher. We have emergency hires for social studies teachers now. There's no one aspect of our public schools that does not have a vacancy now. It oh, just but there to, are some public it, schools it that be, have so better than others. More acute, so it's, it's, it's better, but it's not like all of a sudden there's a panacea in other places. Okay? Um, what we really notice is this, and, it's, and again, our private schools, it's not like the teachers are better, a lot of them are actually from our public schools, it's the consistency, hmm. okay? I was at Campbell High School, you know, in four year period, we lost 100 teachers out of wow. 200 teacher staff. Wow, that's, that's, that, that, you can't do that. I mean, how do you, you can't sound, do that. you're saying that? Okay. Anyway, we are gonna be right <laughs> back in a, in a minute. We're gonna need to take a, a small break here. And when we come back, we wanna discuss What's the solution? And why is the, in uh, Corey's mind, this uh, constitutional amendment at least something, uh, at least a possible solution? Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lo, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at two o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're gonna be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. 
Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'e and our special guest, Corey Rosen Lee, who is the president of the Hawaii Teachers Association. By the way, if you'd like to call in with a question for Corey, the number here is 808-374-2014. Corey, we were talking about the conditions in the public schools because of the I guess you would say lack of funding mm -hmm. and uh, how these conditions may have actually gotten worse since I was, uh, I was in office because uh, well, <laughs> you're saying not only are special education teaching, uh, teaching slots not available, uh, special oh. education teachers not available, qualified, but in a whole number of categories. Is that pretty much the condition or? So we know across the board, whether it's special education or English language learners, Title I, across the board, our teachers are so frustrated with the current conditions. Just, just absolute lack of resources and help. That's why they're leaving. This is not a problem that happens everywhere. We have an American problem, and then we specifically have a Hawaii problem within the American problem. And there has to be the urgency of now for to do the, something. For something about this. Because this is, make, the, everywhere around the world, the, the clear idea is you've got to invest in your kids. Right. It's, it's basically just one of the smartest things a society can do. It, it improves the economy, it lowers social costs, and it's just, this well, is... Well, you know, if you, if you educate one child that, that comes from a, you know, a dysfunctional background, you actually have turned the... The whole cycle around. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you know, and, and it, uh, in the long run, it actually means less tax dollars being paid for a social net. A Absolutely. Social net, and know? that's what we have to realize, and that's what we have to do. Well, um, let me ask you. Okay, so the proposal on the table, because obviously what you want and what you need is uh, more funding, and, uh, or at least more committed funding. Absolutely. And so tell me uh, about uh, this particular amendment to the Constitution, or how, how it came about, and what is it supposed to do? So if we can agree, number one, we need to increase funding for our public schools. And the only question is, how do we do that? Right. Okay. And if you look at it, there are what we consider the four buckets. Okay. The four buckets that bring in enough revenue to actually make a dent in uh, education. Um, you have the general excise tax. Right. You have the income tax. You have the transient accommodation tax, and you have the property tax. Right. Okay. So if you look at those four, first of all, three years ago, we tried the GET, and that okay. went nowhere in the legislature. So when you say you tried the GET, you we tried put up a bill. In increasing the GET. Yes. Our estimate is, is that we spend about $6,000 less per pupil than our comparative districts, which when you multiply times the amount of students we have is nearly a billion dollars. Wow. Yeah. So what are you trying to raise? I mean, okay. uh, since so I would have loved to raise a billion dollars. There's no way to get there. So okay. our first year, what we tried was a one percent increase in the GET, okay, and that would have brought in about eight hundred million dollars additional fund. additional funding, and that would have made a huge difference. Um, and there was just no movement in the legislature to do that. Okay, okay. It, got, it barely got it got through a couple committees, and that was it. Um, now, that's something, by the way, that the legislature has absolute authority over. Absolutely. I mean, they can do okay. it. They can do it themselves. They don't need to go out for any kind of referendum. They need to show the same passion you showed when you, or you <laughs> show when you talk about the needs of education. So during the, when we were going around for that, the one conversation we had with a lot of legislators is they were talking about property taxes. And the reason why is Hawaii is the only state in the entire country that does not use property taxes to fund the schools. We have the lowest property tax rate in the entire country. Right. Um, and so, and the third aspect is, is that our low property tax rates actually are hurting uh, the economy in Hawaii. Okay, so how does that, okay. how, how, what's, yeah, how does that happen? So one third of all property taxes in Hawaii are actually paid by people that don't live in Hawaii. Because of their, their second home. Second homes. And so I'll give you the, the biggest examples in Maui right now. Last year, about half of all homes, 52% of all homes, and 60% of all town homes were bought by people that did not live in Hawaii. Huh, I didn't know that. Okay, so when you have all these outside investors coming in, buying up that much property, 
then all the residents of Maui are fighting for the other 48% of the, the, the available real estate. Which, and then the other thing is, is that uh, foreign investors actually spend, I think the statistic was 50% more for the, the, the cost. So that's driving up the cost for everyone. So what you have is because the 40% or, or well, a huge percentage of homeowners are second homeowners, that they're actually decreasing the supply of housing exactly. on Maui. So the, and because they're willing to pay more money for the homes, they're it's it's driving up the cost. So we have these, uh, these two factors that right. are impacting housing. Okay. And, so, and this is, goes back to last year, more people moved away from Hawaii than moved in. Okay. okay. And um, same thing applies for Native Hawaiians. Well, Native Hawaiians don't like to move. Yeah. They can help. But, but I, the thing I, I is, if think. you have these two things going on, okay. Number one is, we know that education is directly tied to income, okay. and the more education you have, the higher your income you have. So when you're denying a group systemically a quality education, that's a really good okay. point, by the way. That this may be a little bit more than just a lack of funding. It may. It's actually some kind of institutional uh, classification going on. It absolutely is. And it appear and, and, and that and you're suggesting anyway that that uh, institutionalization of poverty also exists with the housing market as well as in the education market. So the question is if you ask why is Hawaii the only um, state not to use property taxes? Is this by some mistake or is this by design? Okay. And you go back 100 years, it was done to discriminate. Okay. Okay. At the time, you have relatively few wealthy landowners. You have the big five, the roots of the big five. Right. You have a few wealthy uh, outborn investors, okay, same problem as we have today, that are buying up vast allowance of land. And they do not want, just like today, the wealthy do not want to share their wealth with the working class. Okay. So they basically work with the legislature to make sure that they didn't tax property taxes as was going on across the uh, United States at the time. But what they did was they wanted to tax the workers to pay for the schools. Okay, okay. That's why okay. we use the GET primarily. All right, all right. But they also said if you educate them beyond the sixth grade, they become a menace. <laughs> they knew that if you, the, the, the plantation workers' children got an education, they could leave the plantation, get better jobs, which, or they, demand, which uh, apparently okay, did. Or demand higher wages right. or start striking. Right. So the best way to make sure you have a docile, cheap labor force is to not deny educate. the education. You know, that was the cornerstone of the 1954 <laughs> de Democratic Revolution. I mean, you, you know, if you're Democrat sitting out there and you want to learn a little bit about your history, you just heard it. Because at one time, uh, Hawaii, all the way up till the 1950s, really had a dual school system. We still have a dual school system. In effect, right? We have the highest rate of private school attendance in the nation. In Honolulu, close to 38% of children go to private school. Wow. There's nothing like that anywhere in the country. And there's nothing wrong. Private school, I mean, pri when we look for this big mystery, um, and even a lot of public school teachers send their kids to private school, and it's not because they don't trust their they, teachers. Is that they don't again? Is if you don't have my. my well, how does that happen? Because these private schools need to be funded, and people that don't make a lot of money seem to be able to afford sending their kids to these schools. Now, well, if they, so Punahou, for example, spends about thirty thousand dollars per pupil. A regular education student in a public school costs ten thousand dollars. You mean we spend one third? Exactly. Huh. How do they That's, afford to do thirty thousand uh, dollars? You have you have two groups. You have first you have so on the mainland, parents pick the communities primarily if they have kids based on how good the schools are. Okay, and if they have good schools, they have high property taxes. Right. Here they have low property taxes, so they don't have to pay that. Well, so they can make the, sure that their own children get that quality education, but how about all the other kids? One of the arguments, and I understand the argument about the, the large landowners and, and the historical basis for that, but one of the arguments is that today, uh, Stanley made this actually very articulately, uh, the fact that, like, yes, that you, you might be taxing a, a class that may, may, may very well need to have more uh, higher property taxes, 
But in the process, you're going to end up making housing for uh, actually, in effect, more expensive, at least for the short term. So the opponents of this argument are trying to make the argument that we're going to tax everyone. Okay? And you, as a former legislator, right. know that if you tried to do that, you'd be out of office. Uh, yeah. Okay? Yes, of and course. so they're just really, just like back then, we don't have the money to compete. So there was recently a Kaka'ako apartment that sold, the average apartment sold for $3.3 million. Yeah, ridiculous. For that $3.3 million, or one townhouse, they can buy out the media market for the next month. And they're going to use that to basically scare everyone, saying they're going to go after your rent. And, they're going to, and that's not the truth. Well, let, let me ask you okay. real quick, because we, we're running out of time, and I'm, I'm really interested in this. Assuming that we can get, we, and I, I, I don't know why we wouldn't have consensus on the need for more money for education. If this constitutional amendment d doesn't pass, what are some of the uh, other alternatives? Because we really need to do something about funding education. And that's education. the thing is, is that 78 percent of people in Hawaii agree that we need to increase funding. No, yeah, we ought to. Okay. But, why? Why? Why but, doesn't our legislature j increase funding? Because the problem is, every single time we throw up one idea, there may be some people that support it, don't support it. This is the best chance we've had in decades to do something, mm -hmm. and it's not multiple choice. Yeah, it's either yes or no. And, and if we vote no, then we'll wish back. Why are we, you know, at 2,000 teachers that don't, you know, are leaving Hawaii Well, what's now? interesting to me is that with the excise tax, clearly 40% of that's paid by tourists anyway, or 30-something percent. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to look for, well, you know, I, I, I just can't see it. But the thing is this, it's not like if you vote on, it's not on the ballot, okay, vote yes for our schools and the Constitution Amendment, or you have a choice of doing the GET, okay? If we vote no... We vote no, we go back to the go drawing back, board. And, and, and the question, current situation is so bad that it causes urgency. And I think the interesting thing you were talking about before was you actually agree that we should be taxing these outside investors a higher I, rate. I do. Uh, so, uh, but you know what amazes me is that you actually don't need this Constitutional Amendment. You don't need to... You don't need to, um, uh, to classify it as a property tax. You can do uh, like extractions. You can do, we used to do, I, I used to do that when I was in office. You know, you want to get this, you want to build these buildings. I mean, why it's not, it's, it doesn't, the conveyance tax doesn't bring in enough. Okay, and the problem is the property tax really does. And again, you want to target it year after year, not a one-time fee. So this is, you, this you, is the best shot that the you, best says, shot. you see right it, now. It really is. And it's time that people in Hawaii wake up to what the educational crisis may be. And this is why when I saw the show, okay, and I really hope, because there, there's going to be a lot of misinformation out there, but specifically, you know, we have the largest group of our children are Native Hawaiians. Native Hawaiians should be enraged by yeah, by those statistics okay. that you showed me, they, absolutely, absolutely. And, so, and also you have these people that are driving up their cost of living, and it's sending Native Hawaiians to move outside of Hawaii. This, is, this will be the chance that we have to really kill well, uh, I hope two that, birds with one stone. I, I hope that whatever happens, that we end up funding education better than we have. <sighs> And even if the amendment doesn't pass, uh, you, the teachers need to be thankful bringing this issue up. Now, if it does pass, uh, you're going to have your hands full working with the legislature doing it, but at least we'd be having, heading in the right direction. Exactly. All right. Okay. I would thank you very thank much, you. Corey. Unfortunately, we're just out of time. <laughs> I do appreciate you being here and giving us the other side of the story. Thank you. Aloha.